Good morning, respected seniors and my dear uh, friends. So far, we have discussed the approach to jaundice and the investigations for jaundice. I would be discussing the differential diagnosis of medical jaundice, which include the disorders of bilirubin metabolism and liver diseases, including hepatocellular dysfunctions and hepatic disorders with prominent cholestasis. To go further, we, for, we need to understand the basic bilirubin metabolism, in which heme in hemoglobin dissociates up to into bilirubin and subsequently into bilirubin and enters the hepatocyte where an enzyme that is uridine gluco glucouronide transferase converts it into monoglucuronide and diglucuronide conjugates. This enters the biliary canalicula by MRP2. So most, so most of the bilirubin is drained outside via the bile. A sum of it is reabsorbed into the plasma by MRP3 and some of it is re enters the uh, liver cells by OATP and the others are excreted via glomerular filtration. Now, coming to unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, it is caused by three causes. One, increased production. Two, decreased uptake. And third, are disorders at the level of conjugation. Those causing increased production include blood transfusion, hemolysis, ineffective erythropoiesis, reabsorptions of the hematoma. Usually, bilirubin remains less than four to five in these cases. Those causing a defect at the level of uptake include rifampicin and cyclosporin, which competitively inhibit the OATP receptor. The third reason being decreased conjugation. This includes all the defects at UGT, that is uridinyl diphosphate glucuronyl transferase enzyme, and the gene associated, that is UGT1A1. Gilbert syndrome is the commonest of these disorders, which include uh, bilirubin less than four, which may rise on fasting and dehydration. The prevalence of Gilbert is quite high. It is up to six to 12% incidence in US and up to two to 4% in India. It is associated with increased gallstones and a toxicity to drugs like ironoticam. Second, pregnant nasal syndrome type one, there's absent UGT1A1 uh, enzyme causing a rise of bilirubin to more than 20 and phototherapy is used as a bridge to liver transplant. Type 2, there's only a reduced activity of this enzyme, causing the bilirubin to rise less than 20, and a phenobarbital responsive jaundice is seen in these cases. Physiological jaundice of newborn is formed by delayed developmental expression of UGT, and drugs like indinavir, atazanavir, competitively inhibit UGT-101. Coming to conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, Dubin-Johnson syndrome is a defect at the level of MRP2. That is, it impairs the secretion of conjugated bilirubin in the canaliculi. Uh, subsequently, increasing the potency of MRP3, the bilirubin ex is excreted in the plasma where it forms cognitures along with albumin and they are not able to secrete via the glomerular filtration. Bilirubin usually remains less than seven. It is increased by estrogens. Their black pigmentations are seen in liposome in the biopsies. There's an increased uro urine coprocorphyrin one is to three ratio. Rotor syndrome, on the other hand, is the impaired reuptake of conjugated bilirubin at the level of OATP. Uh, there is mild increase in urine coprocorphyrin 1 to 3 ratio, and the toxicity to statins is commonly seen in these disorders. Coming to liver diseases, hepatocellular dysfunction, they are divided into two. One is the acute or subacute injury, and the second is CLD. Acute subacute hepatocellular injuries are usually associated with an increase in amino transferase levels, that is, an increase in SGOTPT. As we all know, viral hepatitis and ischemic hepatitis, we all can find uh, SGOTPT up to even thousands. Viral hepatitis like uh, hepatitis A, E, and B, usually 20% of these patients show prodromal syndromes like malleus before jaundice and can be diagnosed serologically. Hepatotoxins like alcohol are commonly known for causing alcoholic hepatitis both in 
our setting as well as in the West, whereas acetaminophen are commonly toxicity is dose dependent, commonly seen in the West. There are also few drugs which cause dose independent toxicities that are idiosyncratic toxicities. Certain vascular outflow disorders like Bartzieri syndrome, sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, and metabolic disorders like Wilson disease, which can be diagnosed with a cereloplasmin, urine copper, and KF ring, are also known to cause acute liver injury. Pregnancy related disorders like AFLP and preeclampsia both occur in third trimester. AFLP is associated with nausea, pain, signs of liver failure, and requires prompt delivery. Preeclampsia in severe form of help may require delivery. Coming to chronic hepatocellular diseases, the, we all know that certain viruses like hepatitis B and C are commonly indicated as a cause of CLD. Also, alcohol is a common cause for causing CLD. The new, uh, the new disease that is emerging both in our setting and the, in the West is a NASH-related uh, CLD that is associated with NFLD. Autoimmune hepatitis, the most common symptom is fatigue. Most common sign being hepatomegaly can be diagnosed with serologically increased IgG, ANA, asthma, and LKM1. Certain biopsies often uh, would uh, suggest interface hepatitis. Celiac disease increases the risk of uh, CLD. A patient 40 to 50 year old with lethargy, arthralgia, pain, newly, new onset diabetes, if the bronze or a slate gray skin would suggest a uh, Evaluation needed for hemochromatosis, which may be done by IRS studies, biopsies, and HFE mutations. Also, patients of CLD with chronic lung disease might require an evaluation for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiencies. Now, coming to hepatic disorders with prominent cholestasis, they can be divided into three headings. One is infiltrative disease, second is cholangiocyte injury, and third is cholestasis with minimal histoplasmic uh, abnormalities. Infiltrative diseases basically disturb the intrahepatic bile ductules, causing cholestasis and jaundice. Certain granulomatous diseases like uh, tuberculosis and sarcoidosis are commonly indicated in this. Also, malignancies, both uh, hepatic and extrahepatic infiltration into the liver, along with lymphoma. Also, patients with macroglossia, malabsorption, heart failure, peripheral neuropathy, uh, protein urea might require an evaluation for amyloidosis. Cholangiocyte injury, a common cause is primary biliary cholangitis, which is more commonly found in female gender. Eight is to one is the gender predisposition. Uh, can be diagnosed with AMA anti-mitochondrial antibodies. A patient in a post-transplant setting, graft versus host disease needs to be considered, along with uh, cholangiocyte injury commonly caused by certain drugs like erythropoietin, trimethoprim, and sulfamethoxazole. Cystic fibrosis, 30% of the liver involvement is being reported. Now, cholestasis with minimal histoplasmic histologic abnormalities, that is a patient having minimal findings over the biopsies. Most common of this is BRIC, that is benign recurrent intrahepatic cholestasis. It is found before the second decade. Patient presents with benign symptoms like recurrent jaundice, malaise, pruritus. With months of these symptoms and months of remission, there is no progressive liver damage. The other part of this over the spectrum is progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis, that is PFIC, in which patient might require a liver transplant. Certain drugs like estrogen anabolic steroids, bacterial infections, they both cause a decrease in bile salt export protein, BACP. Uh, altered enterohepatic circulations is a cause for, is caused by cholestasis by TPN. Certain paraneoplastic syndromes like lymphomas and RCCs are known to cause cholestasis. They resolve with the treatment of the tumor. Third trimester female with pruritus, which resolves with delivery, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy is to be considered. What is important here is that it recurs in subsequent pregnancies. Several metabolic, common metabolic diseases over in children we have discussed, but there are several more rarer disorders which needs a mention, like porphyria, tyrosinemia, carbohydrate metabolism, lysosomal storage disorders, bile acid synthesis, fatty acid oxidation, inborn errors, mitochondrial hepatopathies, and urea cycle disorders. So the take-home message being an efficient history taking in light of clinical settings and scenario, it is utmost important to explore the etiology of jaundice and understanding the wide spectrum of differential diagnosis for jaundice is necessary for all clinicians. Thank you. Yeah.
the street on the Lincoln Avenue of Subsidy. So while I have my slides, I would like to thank the chairpersons, Professor Kapoor and Dr. Ajay for having me here. A very good morning to all of you. So the topic that I've been assigned is to speak about the differential diagnosis of surgical uh, jaundice. So I'd request you to excuse me for some overlaps because as you all might realize that the topics are very closely related. So it's very difficult to have a totally standalone presentation. There will be some overlaps, so please bear with me. Thank you very much. So in the next 10 minutes, I would cover the various DDs of uh, surgical jaundice as Professor Kapoor and Dr. Ajay had asked me to do. So what is surgical jaundice? Any jaundice amenable to surgical or endoscopic treatment, the name is self-explanatory, is called a surgical jaundice. And it is usually due to the obstruction of the extrahepatic biliary tree. Although if we go into the details of obstructive jaundice, so, uh, what I want to say is surgical and obstructive jaundice are not synonymous. Many people may think that they are synonymous, but surgical jaundice and obstructive jaundice are two different. Actually, surgical jaundice is a subset of this uh, big whole of obstructive jaundice and it usually refers to extrahepatic uh, biliary tract obstruction and the signs and symptoms we all are aware from our mbbs days uh, are basically jaundice dark colored urine pale stools pruritus with or without cholangitis however mind you not all cases of obstructive jaundice are surgical that is what i was referring to just a few seconds back Example, viral hepatitis, very commonly. So it is a kind of obstructive jaundice, but it's not a surgical jaundice. It's an intrahepatic obstruction due to the inflammation of the hepatocytes, which leads to obstruction to the bile canalicular flow. And uh, that leads, it is obstructive, but non-surgical. And uh, on the other hand, not all cases uh, of non-obstructive jaundice are medical, especially like hereditary spherocytosis, where is splenectomy, which is a surgical procedure is considered a palliative kind of treatment or not cure but palliation so a few names to remember we again we have all gone through in our during our mbs days but it's important when we are talking about surgical jaundice That's, that is the corbusier's law and it is i will just read it out verbatim in a patient of obstructive jaundice presence of a smooth distended non -go tender gallbladder rules out gallstones as an etiology except the, uh, the exception is the double impaction of stone at the cystic duct and neck and the uh, CBD. Then charcoal triad is for cholangitis, jaundice, pain, fever. And when we add altered mentation and uh, hypotension, that is when the patient presents in shock, it's called Reynolds Pentad. And uh, I would finish this slide by uh, just quoting that gallstone disease remains the most common cause of surgical obstructive jaundice. Again, we all are well aware of that in our practice where we see mostly the jaundice is benign and it's due to gallstones. So now coming to the differential diagnosis proper. So we can classify the various DDs in various ways according to the anatomical location of the obstruction, that is level of obstruction, then whether the etiology of obstruction is luminal, mural or extrinsic, then whether it's benign or malignant, which is of <clears throat> most important clinical significance. And then 1983, Professor Benjamin gave a classification which I thought was quite interesting. So starting with the levels of obstruction, so as we all know that the extrahepatic biliary tree is divided into three uh, zones, the upper, middle and the lower one third, upper one third up to the insertion of the cystic duct, if it's a normal insertion, then uh, the middle one third is from the cystic duct insertion to the supra duodenal part and the retro duodenal and retro pelvic becomes a lower third. So depending on where the obstruction is, upper third, the common causes are most common post polycystectomy biliary injury, which is usually in the upper one third. Hylocholangiocarcinomas, the name is self-explanatory. Gallbladder cancer. Gallbladder cancer uh, uh, can present in many ways. When it presents with SOJ, it can be an upper third or a middle third obstruction. Then portal lymphadenopathy and sclerosing cholangitis, which we don't see that often. When we talk about middle third etiologies, it is most common. That is the CBD stones, Meritzi syndrome, colidocal cysts in children and young adults. Again, gallbladder cancer comes here in this category also. Then we may have biliary parasites. Portal biliopathy, which is a topic which would be discussed uh, later in the day, and then middle third cholangiocarcinomas. And when we come to the lower most part of the CBD, 
Benign causes include acute pancreatitis, usually a pseudocyst can cause uh, transient jaundice, chronic pancreatitis, it's more common. Then periampullary tumors, all the four types, whether it's ampullary or pancreatic or the duodenal or the lower CBD cholangios. Then the duodenal diverticula, less often seen. Pen penetrating duodenal ulcer, it is just to name because it's not seen in, I've not seen in last 20 years any case of jaundice due to penetrating duodenal ulcers. And then retropancreatic, large retropancreatic lymphadenopathy can also sometimes be a DD for obstructive uh, jaundice. So this is just a pictorial representation of what I've just said, and I'll just quickly pass on to the next slide. Then when we come to the next type of classification, that is depending on whether the etiology is intra-CBD or it's in the wall of the CBD or extrinsic, again, the same etiologies we can divide again into intraluminal, which is basically stones or parasites. Mural, it is most common is the benign biliary strictures, which could be iatrogenic, which could be post-inflammatory or post-radiation induced, or it could be cholangiocarcinoma, sclerosing cholangitis, and again, Merit-Seed syndrome. So these are the mural causes. And when we look at extrinsic compression leading to jaundice, obstructive jaundice, most common are chronic pancreatitis and pancreatic tumors, especially uh, see ahead of pancreas, then duodenal tumors. And of course, po portal lymphadenopathy is also not that uncommon. It can be benign or malignant in nature. <clears throat> then the most important is the benign versus malignant from the patient's perspective. So benign causes, again, the same. Uh, things which I'll read out, it's most common is the CBD stones, Merit-Z syndrome, biliary tuberculosis. We all must have seen some cases in our uh, practice, uh, sclerosing cholangitis, primary or secondary, then parasites, most common is the scariasis, then liver flukes, more common in East Asia, not that common. I have seen only three or four cases. I've seen more cases of Ascaris, and that must be same for all of you. Pancreatitis, acute and chronic both, biliary strictures, which can be traumatic or the iatrogenic or radiation induced. And then in children, we have biliary atresia and then colidocal cysts. Uh, colidocal cysts can be seen at all ages, actually. And when we look at the malignant etiology, the most common that we see is the gallbladder cancer in this part of the country, that is North India, then uh, hylocholangios or cholangios at any level, pancreatic cancer or periampullary tumors, and then secondary adenopathies at the porta hepatis or the uh, uh, malignant adenopathies uh, at the porta hepatis or in the lower part that is retropancreatic. So since this is most important to differentiate between benign and malignant, good history taking still remains the key. We have so many investigative modalities and we often keep on talking about all the modalities, their pros and cons, including MRI, the US guided biopsy was being discussed in the previous session. But a history in majority of the cases will give you a, some idea that what we are dealing with, whether it's benign or malignant, and the, it's remained unchanged for the last, since the beginning of, uh, I think, uh, when we started uh, having surgical residencies. That is in benign, the symptoms are usually longstanding. It's seen in a younger age group. Episodes of pain are a hallmark of benign disease. Jaundice may be waxing and waning. Anorexia and significant weight loss are less common because anorexia is just associated during the episode of obstruction and then the patient regains the appetite. And cholangitis is often an accompaniment of the patient's presentation. While on the when we look at the malignant, the history is usually shorter, few months, maybe <clears throat> weeks to months. Patients are in the relatively older age group, but this is not a sign to non because we have seen gallbladder cancer even in young patients, but that is not the rule. That is not common. It's usually in the older age group. And painless progressive jaundice, we all remember by heart even our sleep that painless progressive jaundice is more likely to be malignant, often associated with uh, anorexia and weight loss. And cholangitis, though it can be a presentation, but it's less common. <clears throat> and coming to this Benjamin's classification, so the, it's the, uh, this obstructive obstruction, it's basically on the type or nature of obstruction that they have divided the obstructive jaundice or surgical jaundice into four types. Complete obstruction is usually the etiologies are uh, CA head pancreas, flat skin tumors, or it's a transected li or ligated CBD and during cholecystectomy. Then the type two is the intermittent obstruction, which is more common in patients with the CBD stones, colidocal cysts, duodenal diverticula, and ampullary tumor by per se by the nature of the tumor because it, then when the tumor necrosis, the jaundice comes down. So it is a kind of intermittent obstruction vis-a-vis -vis C head of the pancreas, which is more of a continuous complete obstruction. Then intrabiliary pap uh, parasites and biliary papillomas are other causes of intermittent obstruction. Then type 3 is a chronic incomplete obstruction, which is often seen in patients of sclerosing cholangitis, post-radiation, stenosis of the various anastomoses of uh, uh, not only the bilioenteric anastomosis, even a 
uh, bilio biliary anastomosis stricture can be a co cause of chronic and complete obstruction then cystic fibrosis and chronic pancreatitis are other causes and the last is the type 4 where we have the segmental obstruction usually seen in uh, patients of Carolee's disease or more common, especially in the eastern part of the country, is the recurrent pyogenic cholangitis, where we have multiple intrahepatic stones, usually limited to a segment or a sector of the liver. So it leads to segmental obstruction. More often, patients don't have high jaundice, rather more of cholangitis in such situations. And then sclerosing cholangitis. Sclerosing cholangitis can uh, present in myriads of ways. It can be, you can have a dominant hyla stricture, but very often we have seen uh, they have patients present with segmental strictures. And again, jaundice is not a common presentation in such patients. And when we look at the causes of obstructive jaundice in children, most common, nearly 80%, it's biliary atresia followed by cholidocal cysts, cholidocolithiasis again uh, seen, it's not very rare, but in older children, biliary parasites are often more often seen in children. Then we have other less common uh, conditions like inspissated bile syndrome, allergial syndrome, which are both, these are genetic conditions, cystic fibrosis, chronic and acute pancreatitis can be, is, age is no bar for this con these conditions. So again, children can present with a large pseudocyst leading to lower CBD obstruction, presenting with jaundice. And then spontaneous perforation of bile duct is another uncommon DD. So with that, I would come like to complete this uh, short presentation on the DDs of surgical obstructive jaundice. Thank you. And I'll ha be happy to take questions. Thank you. Is there any audience? Uh, since we have uh, new students who have joined it, I would like to re-announce again that more number of questions you ask, more opportunity to you for you to win a prize. We want a more active interaction from the residents. Your questions, you may feel it is invalid, but they are usually valid for all of us. So uh, we already have made an announcement that five best uh, people who are most interactive for the questions will be awarded the book of pearls of surgery, which uh, kindly Dr. Kapoor has agreed to give as a prize. And uh, we have judge our uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Vinay Mela, who will be judging you all. So please be more interactive and you can ask more number of questions. So with that, I hand over the mic to the chair. Uh, now I invite Dr. Anurag Govind. Uh, on the session, when to think of uncommon and unusual causes of journeys. Good morning, everybody. I sincerely thank Dr. Kapoor for having given me this opportunity to be here with the postgraduates. And believe me, it's always a privilege. Well, when it comes to postgraduates, it's always bi-directional. So by the time he's getting my slides, I'll start with a question. I've heard a lot about uh, surgical jaundice not being surgery, not meaning surgery. Can anyone here tell me one incidence where it's truly medical jaundice, the answer comes from surgery, indirect hyperbilirumia, you land up getting a surgery done. Anyone? I I request sir to take this question as part of the competition that he's organized here. So anyone who can tell me indirect hyperbilirubia requires a surgery at times. No, not necessary. Well, agree one and anything else? Two, you're right there. So select me for maybe heritage serocytosis. You have indirect hyperbilirubia. So any other, any other? That's good. So you could have a large hematoma giving rise to indirect hyperbilirubia, which may require a drain. So not necessarily that medical jaundice will always be medically treated. So it's time for us to actually now move out of the books. You've heard so much on jaundice today, and you're all experts now. So we'll now move to the wards in my session. And Dr. Kapoor has actually uh, brought up a fairly unusual topic, 
the topic for my discussion by the time it comes up there is unusual concept of jaundice. When to start suspecting unusual concept of jaundice? So what I'll be doing in the next 10 minutes is by the time these slides come up, so this is something which you will not find in books, unusual causes of jaundice. So whatever little clinical experience that I have, I've used that to actually divide this topic into six groups. And we'll take up without slides. So we'll take up uh, groups. With actual cases. At the end of each case, we'll see if there's a learning experience. I'm sorry for this. During this delay, Dr. Uh, Google can ask more questions to the residents. I think that will make it interactive for them during the time. Okay, there was a question by uh, Parth. He was presenting, and uh, the imaging there was a discussion that MR versus CT scan. So for a hyaluronic astroma, how many of you think that CT scan is mandatory? Raise your hands. Just raise your hands. How many of you think that for a hyaluronic astroma surgery, CT scan is mandatory? If you think yes, you may raise your hand. How many of you think that MR is mandatory? You may raise your hand. So less number for MR. I think so wrong. And how many of you think that both are mandatory? So I think we have some uh, good uh, senior people who are sitting over here who feel that both are mandatory. So can say anybody to tell why both are mandatory for a hydrocolytic asthma? Anyone, any of your seniors, uh, any uh, funny you can take a data? Can can we have a mic, please? Mic, mic. Why uh, both CT and MR are required for a hydrocolytic asthma surgery? The, the MRI obviously is to get a very good uh, financial plan. So you are three or four several study of hypothesis and you say you want to take it. And I think uh, MRI five is would also be will do the other things also be the vascular so this is pretty, but surgeons as uh, we're not really uh, comfortable that uh, we just more 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 rely on the reports in MRI. So I think he has hit the bull, right? The main reason to ask was that uh, it is actually the vascular anatomy that we want to identify that is uh, required. That's why I think funny you mean that for CT scan is required. You know, anybody else, maybe Dr. Shalini can take up any advantage of CT. Uh, other than the master, if it's a right side dissection that you are planning, the right back is the main decision. You can dissect the can go to the you can even dissect the artery provided you have some relationship. So if it's a right side boomer that you are doing, you are saving the right side and the artery is involved, then it's kind of very difficult to dissect. So artery for that and that would uh diagnose the level of whether it's not only by hypothetical or second or third order by the involvement on the side because of MRC definitely secure. 
But if I have been given a choice to choose one, I would choose two. You should see. Okay, we'll take up the discussion after the second session, third session, or maybe later whenever we have a spare of time. So I'll hand over to Dr. Gobind sir. Thank you, Jim. So uh, we leave the slides like this. And I'll request the chairperson to be a little lenient with me when it comes to time. If we can start now. All right. So, like I said, we've got these six segments, and we each take each one of these with the case and see if we can learn something. So, let me come to the first, which is atypical clinical presentation. We're talking of unusual jaundice, how to suspect. So, here is a 20 year old male who presented to our hospital emergency. High grade fever with chills for five days, jaundice for the last two days. And the day that he presented to us, the patient was in encephalopathy. Additional history was that there was decreased urine for the last one day. The patient from the emergency was admitted under us as a case of fulminant hepatic failure. Came in the first few reports. The SGOT PT were not very highly raised. INR, yes, was marginally raised, I expected. A creatinine of 2.3. Now, we were not very happy. We thought this is unlikely to be fulminant hepatic failure because of a hepatotrophic virus. And why we say that is that the treating unit thought there is fever persisting with high jaundice, unusual for viral hepatitis. LFTs, again, not favoring viral hepatitis. The enzymes are not as high as I would expect them to be. And very early onset of renal dysfunction. So the treating unit thinks that we should rule out malaria in this patient. And here it is. The viral markers all turned out to be negative. The patient was falciparum positive. So is there a learning point here? Yes. So if you have fever, which persists despite jaundice, deep jaundice. The LFTs, if they don't favor viral hepatitis, and you know what LFT in a viral hepatitis is like, you had these previous lectures, an early multi-organ dysfunction. Start thinking in terms of systemic causes rather than just hepatotrophic viruses. Could be even enteric for all you know. This I'll skip because you've already had in the previous lectures, LFT showing isolated hyperbilirubinemia and how to approach it. So I'll skip this slide. So the second category, which could be an atypical biochemical presentation or radiology presentation, 40-year-old gentleman, typical prodome lasting five days. Here the LFTs are like what they should be for a viral hepatitis patient. We do viral markers and there is hepatitis E positive. No harm done, nothing unusual. Clinically and biochemically, the patient is viral hepatitis. But on examination, we find that this patient has abdominal distension, just five days of history. There is shifting dullness. And so the treating unit, which was ours, thought that there has to be an underlying chronic illness. This cannot be just acute viral hepatitis. So ascites coming up that early, we thought of chronic liver disease besides acute E. Did an ultrasound, there was evidence of chronic liver disease. Did an endoscopy, as expected, portal hypertension evidence in form of viruses. So again, is there a learning message here? So if you have an obvious acute insult to the liver, both clinically and biochemically, but you have even one single parameter, whether it be clinical or biochemical, which does not fall in line, start thinking in terms of acute on chronic liver disease. So whether it be early ascites, whether it is very low albumin, whether it is a patient of encephalopathy with prothrombin time almost normal, or even the reverse, very high prothrombin time, conscious patient, an acute insult just few days. So anything unusual that goes either clinically or biochemically, think of underlying chronic liver disease over and above an acute injury. Let's come to the third group. So you have a mismatch now. 
64 year old man no comorbidities one month painless progressive polystatic jaundice anorexia weight loss yes they are there lft is suggestive of obstructive jaundice serology for viruses as expected are all negative but the problem is the ultrasound and also the mrcp done is not suggesting obstructive jaundice so what do we do the solution lies in investigating this patient further so here is a mismatch the radiology is not supporting our clinical and biochemical impression so this patient was investigated further turned out to be ana positive igg4 were elevated the biopsy also supported igg4 hepatopathy the upper one is igg4 stain and the lower one is typical as the usual h and e so the here the message is that if you have cholestasis clinical cholestasis but there is no ihbr dilatation there's a huge list of differential diagnoses but some common ones are psc igg4 that we just talked about granulomatous hepatitis primary biliary cirrhosis cholestasis of pregnancy some drugs and benign recurrent intrahepatic cholestasis let's come to the fourth some very common conditions but have unfortunately missed and i must submit here again one of our patients and i missed the diagnosis 68 year old female diabetic hypothyroid comes with upper abdominal discomfort for one month all routine investigation done only positivities are a fatty liver on ultrasound and scpt 55 we are happy we reach somewhere sent on symptomatic treatment and vitamin e for fatty liver three months later she presents again now she has got jaundice and lethargy her lfts are deranged we do an extensive test battery on her negative viral markers all autoimmune markers no chronic liver disease we also done ultrasound fibro scan endoscopy everything that you can think of we've done on her there is no diagnosis available so the treating unit which is again me we have no lead excepting just a borderline positive ana that we got so i thought that we might as well do a liver biopsy maybe this is autoimmune liver disease now comes in a savior a smart resident like you all he goes back to the patient he revisits the history and here it is herbal supplements giloy she was on for the last 6 months which she did not reveal until she was specifically asked for it and you all know in the covid times we got a lot of patients with this problem because they were all taking a lot of giloy so the what's the message here always always remember to rule out drug induced liver injury as it is frequently overlooked there is no substitute to a good history can we go to the next slide it's not changing yeah thank you the next uh, segment is uncommon diseases but they are actually obvious if you are alert I saw one of the same kinds this morning also in the ICU. Twenty-seven-year-old female, three weeks of jaundice, fever, I'll, fever, diarrhea, vomiting, and weight loss. There is no other significant history, and she has come to us with a very detailed evaluation, which does not suggest any acute or any chronic liver injury. So while I'm examining this patient, I find there's tachycardia. There is deep ictus. hepatomegaly but on abdominal examination i find that there's a very bounding aorta it's actually going tuck tuck right below my hand so what i do is i start examining this patient all over again i find systolic hypertension there is no exophthalmos there is no thyroid swelling but i'm still not convinced so i do my thyroid function on this patient and here this patient has come to us with extensive evaluation for liver diseases and the prior thyroid profile 
was consistent with thyrotoxicosis. We presented this patient in one of the international conferences and this presentation got a prize. So the jaundice in such patients are known to happen because of hyperthyroid per se, antithyroid drugs, thyrocardiacs, nice, nice fancy name, but they can have heart failure, atrial fibrillation, and other associated autoimmune disorders in form of autoimmune hepatitis and PBC. So the message here is, then astute clinical examination will never lose its relevance, despite all investigations. Simple clinical examination can lead to uncommon diagnosis. The last is when you have a definite diagnosis, but the clinical response is just not happening. So then start thinking why. And here is this unfortunate 65-year-old doctor from Gandhanagar. He came to us with obstructive jaundice, both clinically and biochemically. CT revealed a mass head of pancreas. We went ahead, did an EUS, took an FNA, FNA turned out to be AFB positive. Definite tuberculosis, there's no doubt, AFB positive. Stented the patient, put on ATT. Next two months, there was weight gain, symptomatic improvement. But this doctor kept coming back to us with recurrent cholangitis. Almost about three months down the line, we realized, when we investigated further, that the mass is not regressing despite symptomatic improvement. We're not happy. So we do an FNA and find that he's got mucinous adenocarcinoma. What I want to tell you here is, even if there's a clear, definite diagnosis, it's never enough. Keep all your antennae open till you get complete clinical resolution. And that's when you say you've done it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Remember always that, particularly in ICU, the setting of ICU and setting of hemodynamics, the oncoming zombies, we should not miss the clinical trials. When we achieve one investigation, we should not be bothered in the setting of system of injection in the oncoming Second, Suppose a patient has an atmosphere that may the long duration and he has dilated ducts. So he is slowly by dilation for a period of time after his stepping or the that. Suppose this patient does not have a And if we go for some of the see dilated ducts, we talk about the observing the jurisdiction and all the conscious patients. Similarly, Patient are expected to be obstruction and dilated that suppose they have cholangitis. So, cholangitis, ongoing cholangitis will mask the picture of IHBR dilatation and we can miss it. So these are three clinical solutions we must have to do the form for any random patient journals. If there is any recommend by the experts, then we will be going to do this. Doctor Lesser, can you take two or three Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Vicky Kapoor, sir. Uh, so I prepared it differently. As uh, Ajay, sir, told that uh, if the students are not asking questions, we'll backfire. Uh, sorry, we'll discuss all these things. And uh, if someone answers, then we can include if uh, sir wants in for the 
pulse of book uh, as a gift. So please, uh, this is, these questions are for the students. Uh, so the following entity can cause uh, both intrahepatic and extrahepatic cholestasis. The options are uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, viral hepatitis, primary sclerosing cholingitis, and sarcoidosis. I'm expecting some answer. Any answer? Sarcoidosis? PSC. Anyone can explain that? Yeah, definitely the answer is, uh, so who answered this? Okay. I request to Dr. Rubina Mela to consider it. So the answer is definitely primary sclerosis and cholingitis because uh, the PSC causes intrahepatic and extrahepatic uh, 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 stasis because of a small duct uh, inclusion in uh, PSC. Viral hepatitis uh, causes intrahepatic cholestasis and, uh, and sarcoidosis of it only intrahepatic duct. So the question two is on routine examination, a 25 year old man is found to have laboratory value as follows. Total bilirubin is 15 milligram per deciliter and unconjugated bilirubin is 0 0.8. ALT is 18, AST is 25, alkaline phosphatase is 80. A liver biopsy is performed and the tissue obtained is black in appearance, which of the following disorder is the cause of the above condition. The options are Rotter syndrome, Gilbert syndrome, prickler nazar and Eubin Johnson. Dubin Johnson. Dubin Johnson. Yeah. So answer is uh, definitely Dubin Johnson because the click is uh, the only if the patient is uh, the person is having conjugated hyperbilirubinemia with pigmented liver and uh, the Dubin Johnson causes the problem in uh, uh, the transport of uh, bile and that causes the pigmentation of the liver. So again, the question number three is a 53 year old woman present complaining of fatigue over the past six months, developed pruritus, pruritus and medical history is significant only for Jorgen syndrome. On physical examination, she is ephebrile and has mild icteric sclera. There are excoriation noted on uh, four extremities and trunk. On palpation, liver is normal. There is no ascites clinomegaly in peripheral edema. And laboratory results are normal CBC, normal electrolytes, and liver function test. Alkaline phosphatase is 260, and uh, total bilirubin is 3.1, and normal transaminous level. Which of the following is most likely diagnosis? Primary bilirubin cirrhosis. So, again, the answer is primary bilirubin cirrhosis. As this is the classical presentation of middle aged women and associated with the Jogren syndrome and uh, definitely the acute hepatitis uh, does not last for more than six months and primary sclerosing cholingitis is uh, usually present in young male and associated with the inflammatory bowel disease. So this question, a 41 year old male seen in ED with acute onset of uh, yellowish discoloration of eyes, nausea and vomiting he returned from Southeast Asia three weeks ago. LFT bilirubin is 2.98, AST is 432, uh, ALT is 522, and ALP is 152, albumin is 3.5. Options are alcoholic hepatitis, colducolithesis, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and primary bilirubin cirrhosis. Hepatitis A. Hepatitis A, yes. The answer is hepatitis because it's a short incubation period. And AST and ALT will be high many poles and near normal mild increase in uh, alkaline phosphatase. And uh, the in cordocal ETS is definitely alkaline phosphatase will be high many fold than AST and ALTs. So, thank you. make <laughs> And uh, we all need to know uh, one question to uh, Dr. Akash. How useful or important is um, uh, the 
genetic mutation analysis for uh, confirming Gilbert syndrome. Do we have any other investigation short of that uh, to con confirm Gilbert's? Because we, we have this uh, mutation testing, uh, um, at least in Hyderabad, it's, it's quite uh, easily available. I don't think it's the case in the rest of the country. The genetic testing is not easily available, but uh, we are getting it done for few patients who are where the diagnosis is in question. Ideally, uh, uh, unconjugated bilirubin less than four, varying with fasting, is quite enough to label it as a liver. It is very common up to two to four percent in Indian setting. So, unnecessary testing for it is not necessary most of the times. Even in the US, liver syndrome is not considered as disease in the norm. Yes. In yes. I request only Munish to make any special comments when dealing with children with jaundice at different ages. Oh, thank you, sir. Including me in this panel of uh, medical jaundice, and uh, I try to get the group with concern. And I question that uh, genetic uh, testing is now available all over the India because outsourcing is there. We can send the samples, and uh, things are not so difficult. We are getting all type of genetic testing and even sometimes patients are also pressing. In pediatric age group, the neonatal rollout diagnosis uh, spectrum is totally different. We are means, having physiological jaundice than different spectrum, pathological jaundice. First day, college might be more towards the hemolytic side. Then later on, and very important thing which I want to tell to all postgraduates is that as far as extrapatic bilirubin at is concerned, most of the time, our patients are failing to reach diagnosis before 8 to 12 weeks. We are uh, lagging in that sense because still we are diagnosing these patients that have 6 months or 7 months. So early we are diagnosing these and they are attending the OPDs. But sometimes we are taking so long time for the investigating and all that window where we can provide the little bit uh, definitive better treatment we might be missing. So, extrapatic bilirubin is very, very common and uh, it can be easily diagnosed that we have discussed till now. And other causes also, recently we have discussed in our uh, clinical meeting that Neiman disease and other genetic disorder, rare metabolic disorders are not so uncommon as considered till now. Reason is that the most of the time, some of our uh, clinicians even if they are suspecting the metabolic disorder, they will tell that no treatment is available and patients are leaving the things on their own. So, prenatal diagnosis and antenatal diagnosis is also possible in these cases. So, undoubtedly, pediatric age group causes are uh, not as we are seeing in the adults and all the, although we have listed the rotor and Julian uh, Johnson and all. So, uh, I think we can organize some other session also for pediatric journalists. So that will put more light on the causes and uh, we can discuss. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you, Chairpersons, for this sharing of the session. Yes, sir. Just make one point with regards to the question. Actually, sarcoidosis, I have seen patients presenting with both intrahepatic as well as strahepatic journalists. Sarcoidosis, one is it's an infiltrative kind of region uh, in the river that can lead to jaundice and other than large lymph nodes. Adenopathy causing obstructive jaundice and sarcoidosis is reported. And the second doctor is presented a very nice case. It's very close to my heart. The first case that you presented about malaria. Yeah. So we have seen not only malaria, even in the daily that is presents exactly the same way that you presented the race. So we start looking at uh, permanent hepatic failure and hepatic causes, but we should always be watchful for non-hepatic causes of permanent, so-called permanent hepatic presentation. And the cat is early uh, other organ involved, multi-organ. That is a very important thing to include. Otherwise, you way, we start preparing these patients for transplant and then you get that. Thank you, Chairpersons, for the chairing this session. Next, next session is on images in joint.